Seawall. I hope you're staying safe and well. Welcome back to another video tutorial on Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde. In today's lesson we are looking at chapter 5, the incident of the letter. Before we start let me just remind you it's really important that you've read the chapter in advance because I'm not going to focus on the entire chapter. Uh, I'm going to focus today on two passages from that chapter. The first passage is the description of Jekyll's house. We're going to look at the symbolic significance of Jekyll's house, particularly the laboratory, the dissecting rooms uh, and the cabinet. And we're going to talk about how Stevenson uses symbolism in his uh, depiction of Jekyll's house and, and what that symbolism might represent. We're then going to look at the passage in which uh, Mr. Mr. Guest, one of Usterson's friends, um, looks at the two letters, one letter supposedly written but, uh, to Henry Jekyll, the other Henry Jekyll, uh, and he notices the similarity of the handwriting, which of course is a very significant clue to your first time reader that Jekyll and Hyde are in fact the same person, because like your fingerprint, uh, your handwriting it is unique to you, uh, so it implies a shared identity. Let's start today's lesson by having a look at a chapter summary. Uh, once that's done, uh, you'll hear my voice again. But just a reminder, if you haven't already read the chapter, now is your chance to pause the video, uh, go away, read the chapter and come back. See you soon. Before we start, I think it's significant to talk about Jekyll's house and how it's been presented so far. Uh, we know that in chapter one, the story of the door, the door actually that is referred to the, the, is, a, the, is the rear door to Jekyll's house. And I spoke in that lesson about how I believe the house is modelled on the townhouse of the celebrated Victorian anatomist and dissector, uh, John Hunter. And as you can see in the floor plan on your screens, John Hunter's house had two separate wings. One wing was designed for him to be able to uh, accept bodies left for him for his dissections on, at the back entrance and bring them forward and through to the uh, surgical theatre in the middle of the house. And I think there's a very similar, uh, it's almost too coincidental in terms of the layout of Jekyll's house and how that's described. I think Jekyll's house therefore comes to serve as a symbol of duality, just like John Hunter's house represented his dual life in a sense, you know, one part of his life being, uh, you know, involved in criminal affairs and illicit activity. I think so too is Jekyll's house uh, a symbol of his dual nature, the, the rear door representing his criminal uh, and illicit uh, his criminal personality and the illicit activities he'd undertake uh, and the front door uh, representing his respectability, his, digni his dignified position in Victorian society and I suppose his status as a Victorian gentleman. So I think Jekyll's, Hyde, um, Jekyll's house in that sense uh, clearly comes to symbolise duality as do so many other things in the novel. Jekyll's laboratory we'll look at in today's lesson in more detail but I would argue uh, from the outset, that I, I I interpret the laboratory, the laboratory and the cabinet as being a symbol that comes to represent Jekyll's psyche and his state of mind, and I'll and I'll argue that point uh, as we look through the passage we're about to read. Let's have a read through the passage. Uh, it's the beginning of chapter five, and then we will perform a close reading. Okay. It was late in the afternoon when Mr. Utterson found his way to Dr. Jekyll's door, where he was as once admitted by Paul and carried down the, by the kitchen officers and across the yard, which had once been used uh, as a garden, to the building which was indifferently known as the laboratory or the dissecting rooms. The doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon, and his own taste being rather chemical than anatomical, had changed the destination of the block at the bottom of the garden. 
It was the first time that the lawyer had been received in that part of his friend's quarters, and he eyed the dingy, windowless structure with curiosity, and gazed around with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theatre, once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw, and the lights falling dimly through the foggy cupola. At the further end, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red baize, and through this, Mr. Utterson was at, once, was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room, fitted with glass presses, furnished, amongst other things, with a cheval glass and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows, barred with iron. The fire burned in the grate, a lamp was set lighted on the chimney shelf, for even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly, and there, close to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deadly sick. He did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand and bade him welcome in a changed voice. So I'm not going to spend a great deal of time talking about the opening of the passage. What I will say is I think there is an allusion here to John Hunter. The fact that Jekyll has bought his house from a celebrated surgeon, the heirs of a celebrated surgeon, I think that's a, that's a subtle reference to John Hunter. Um, I think the fact that Jekyll's house includes a, dissect, a dissecting room does make it a rather gothic setting and it kind of implies a sinister nature to the owner of the house as well. Um, the first quote I want to focus on, and this is, I suppose, the quote that leads me into my argument, my main argument that I would make if I was interpreting what the significance of Jekyll's house actually is and what the significance of the lab is. I think it becomes, firstly, a symbol. Uh, first, it's an important symbol. I think it comes to represent Jekyll's, Jekyll's psyche, his state of mind. Uh, and I think later, as the novel develops, from really this moment onwards, it becomes a symbol of imprisonment or self-confinement. Um, just to be very clear, uh, it links to how Jekyll is described later in the passage. At this moment in the chron chronology, I suppose in this, mo in this moment in the linear narrative, this point is where Jekyll has started to lose control in his transformations. He started to become overwhelmed by Hyde and overpowered by Hyde. And really, we learn in chapter 10 that Jekyll initially enjoys the experience of being Hyde, enjoys the freedom that it offers him. But the uh, potency of his elixir weakens and he's unable to control when he transforms into Hyde. And Hyde overpowers him and, uh, and overwhelms him. And at this point in the narrative, we, we are met with a De Jekyll that looks deadly sick and pale because of that. And also because, of course, he is a, a, a now a wanted murderer and he's committed this awful sin, this, you know, damnable sin. Um, so I think that the going back to the house, I think it serves as a symbol for a state of mind. And I'll talk about some of the symbols that Je that uh, Stevenson employs to refer to Jekyll's state of mind. But I also think it comes to serve as a symbol for self-imprisonment, um, which I suppose links actually to Jekyll's mind again, in a sense, because Hyde is imprisoned within Jekyll. I mean, Hyde uses Jekyll as a, as a sanctuary, as a retreat. So there's lots of layers of meaning in terms of, when I, when I use this phrase, imprisonment and containment. I mean, Hyde con is, is contained within Jekyll. They are, of course, the same person. And Hyde will, Hyde uses Jekyll as a, as a there's a great quote later in the novel where, he, where Jekyll declares that Hyde saw, used him as a mountain bandit uses a cave. So he sees Jekyll as being a place of refuge and a sanctuary from, uh, from the police and from the law after he's committed these awful crimes. So the first really pertinent symbolic quotation, um, I think, is, is the quotation here, the dingy windowless structure. That's how the... the the wing of the house is described that contains the lab and contains the cabinets. I think it's significant. Again, dinginess is often used by Stevenson and you know, light and dark we've looked at throughout the novel is used as a metaphor, I suppose, for good and evil. And I think the fact that his house is dingy implies vice, implies sin. Um, just like the back door, uh, this 
adjective windowless is very important. The fact that there are no windows to this area of the house uh, obviously implies secrecy, privacy, and, and, and someone harboring a secret. And of course, the secret that Jekyll harbors is the fact that he has performed this um, blasphemous experiment. He's, he's, he's broken the laws of nature. He has uh, committed an act of heresy by splitting his personality in two. So there is this kind of, again, it kind of emphasizes the mad scientist aspect of Jekyll's personality. So the dinginess and the windowless aspects are very symbolic. We then have the description of the theatre, the surgical theatre, which is now gaunt and silent. And, and it, that's juxtaposed with how it used to be crammed full of e with eager students. And I think the, the adjectives gaunt and silent again emphasise Jekyll's solitary nature, his private personality, the fact that he's become friendless in his pursuit of uh, this transcendental medicine. He's lost his friends, he's lost his, he's lost, uh, his companions. We then have some more examples of symbolism. Uh, we have the description of the tables littered with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with straw. So we have this idea of the, the, the essentially the deterioration and the degradation. Um, the fact that this once great surgical theatre is now dilapidated, I think is significant and represents Jekyll's state of mind. I think the fact that the tables are laden with chemical apparatus, again, hints at one of the themes of the novel that runs throughout the novel, which is addiction, but also implies this idea of madness as well. Uh, this, I think the kind of tropes here being used by Stevenson are suggestive of the mad scientist figure, you know, a, a disorganized mind, a mind uh, that is in chaos. Um, I think the fact that the straw, the, the, the ground is littered with straw, is also a subtle ref reference to kind of the animalistic nature of Jekyll. You know, that's what Hyde is. Hyde, he's released his animalistic instincts, and I suppose that is, might be a subtle reference to that aspect of his personality. And once again, Stevenson uses light imagery uh, to describe the kind of dinginess of. Jekyll's house and, and the dinginess represents, the, I, I would say, the, the amorality or the lack of morality in the house. The next aspect of symbolism I think is really important is the red baize door. Uh, so we have this door that leads to the cabinet, here's my door, and it's, and it's bright red. And I think that's significant that the door that leads into Jekyll's cabinet, his most private room where he conducts his experiments, ha, ha, you know, it's associated with that colour which is of course I think representative of you know hell, damnation. Um, I think it's it's represents a warning, something dangerous. Uh, so the red baize cabinet door leads into the cabinet, which I would argue, as I, I've said earlier, the cabinet represents Jekyll's psyche, his state of mind, uh, how disorganised, chaotic, and unstable his mind actually is. And we have subtle clues about Jekyll's state of mind throughout the description of the house and particularly the cabinet. So we've entered the cabinet, it's a large room, and we have lots of glass presses. We have uh, a cheval glass, a business table, and we have these other symbols, the, the dusty windows and the fire. I'll take these all in turn, because I think all of these uh, images here, all of these objects are symbolic. And I've no noticed it's the third time I've written the word symbolism at this point. I'll start with the glass presses. The glass presses are used in his, in his chemical experiments. And I think, again, they're symbolic here of his instability, his madness, the disorganized state of his mind. The second symbol I would talk about um, are the three dusty windows barred with iron. So here's our, here are our windows, and they are barred with iron. And I think it's significant, this symbol of the dusty windows barred with iron, really evocative or, and reminiscent of a prison cell and the windows you would see in a prison cell. And I think, going back to my earlier point about how this cabinet represents his self-isolation, his uh, retreatment, his, his, his reclu reclusive nature, the fact that he's retreated from society, um, he's become imprisoned within the cabinet in the same way in which he's hide and has become you know, he's become imprisoned by Hyde in a sense. Hyde has overpowered him. 
So the dusty windows represent this idea of confinement, of um, being trapped within his own body and his own mind, but also within his own uh, laboratory. Um, and what's significant later on in the novel is that he doesn't leave the cabinet. He becomes more and more reclusive and the cabinet really does become his jail cell and finally it becomes his uh, grave. He, he, he commits suicide here. So there is a kind of this, this place of isolation and um, solitary, solit uh, and solitariness becomes later on a more significant um, motif that runs throughout the novel. We then have another symbol, the fire burning in the grate. And you, you may have noticed how many times fire is referred to, that each of the Victorian gentlemen tend to sit before the fire in the hearth. Uh, I think the fire is again another symbol that represents the damnation of Jekyll. It represents forbidden knowledge, of course. It comes straight from that Promethean myth. So we have that kind of gothic image of fire burning in the grate, the lamp being lit as well. And then we have a peculiar description, which I, thought I find always, students have always find this description quite odd. And that's of the, the personification, I'll put personification, personification, of the fog lying thickly in the house. And it, I think it's a strange description because we've had so many descriptions of the fog throughout the novel. And I've talked a lot about how the fog represents duality. It represents how uh, the Victorian could, gentleman could conceal uh, his his secret personality. It represents how uh, the fog throughout the novel uh, conceals hide and conceals danger in the city. And what's interesting here is it's invaded the domestic space. The fog is now inside the house. And again, I think the fog here is used to refer to Jekyll's duality, the fact that he is concealing, like the fog is, he is concealing a great secret, which is, of course, that he is a murderer. We have to remember that Jekyll uh, and Hyde are the same person, and therefore he has committed a murder, and he's concealing that from the law. He's concealing his secrets from his friends. Um, I missed a symbol out, which is actually quite important later in the novel, um, and that is our cheval glass. I'll just draw what that means. It's called a cheval glass because, as my great picture represents, uh, this is our mirror, cheval glass. Uh, it's called a cheval glass because it's like a horse. That's, that's what the word is in French, cheval. It has four legs. So it, it's a cheval glass. It's a, it's a four-legged four mirror. And I think the cheval glass becomes to represent identity. Again, it's a symbol, in my opinion, in the novel. And later on, we learn that Jekyll watches himself transform using this cheval glass. So it actually represents his kind of, again, his morbid curiosity, his... his um, arrogance, his, his hubris, because he, he kind of takes pride in his experiment and in his achievements. What also happens later on in the novel is there's a description when Utterson and Paul break down the door in chapter 8, they see multiple reflections in the cheval glass. And I think the cheval glass comes to represent how identity is fragmented, that, that, that human beings have multiple identities, which I think is the point that Stevenson is trying to make in this novel quite subtly. I think he's arguing that human identity is not stable, it's in flux, it's unstable, and that actually our identity is not just one thing. There is no singular I, it, uh, there, there are multiple personalities within each of us. I think that's one of the arguments that Stevenson's making in this novel. So we have this cheval glass as well. So if we just very quickly uh, re recap on the use of symbolism here, we have firstly uh, the windows that are barred, then we have the red and the colour red and the baize door being red. We have the fire, the fog, uh, the cheval glass. Uh, all of these symbols, rather almost gothic tropes and certainly tropes that you'd associate with the mad scientist figure. But certainly I think also symbolic of other ideas, particularly what I said earlier, this idea that the, the whole cabinet, in my opinion, represents his, his mind uh, and the chaos of his mind, the disorganisation of his mind. Uh, and the fact that he's a prisoner of his own self. In, in, in chapter 10, he describes how he's always, been, uh, he's always been forced to live a double life. He feels imprisoned within his identity. And I think this is what the cabinet represents later on. We then have, and we'll have a checkpoint momentarily, uh, we then have uh, a, a description of Jekyll, which I think is worth 
noticing. Um, and Jekyll, from chapter five, in chapter five and, and later in the novel, becomes a, a sickly figure. He actually recovers later on, but at this point he's deadly sick. Uh, he doesn't rise. He has a cold hand, uh, and he has a changed voice. And all of these are obviously subtle hints in that he is grieving or in shock uh, or feeling terrible feelings of guilt because we of course know that Jekyll has become a murderer. Remember a first time reader at this point still might not know that. They, they still might think that Jekyll and Hyde are separate people and that Jekyll is being blackmailed by this murderous character. But we know that he's, he's actually they're one and the same. So these hints from Stevenson, these descriptions of Jekyll's change, uh, the fact that he's seemingly um, worsened physically and become more ill, become, become sickly, are hints that he's actually, one, he, you know, we know that he's feeling guilty, that he's feeling horrified by what he's done. And so I think it's, it's significant that Jekyll is presented in this way as well, because it contrasts so dramatically. We have to remember what, what, what he's like in chapter three, and we have those quotations here, you know, he's a large, smooth-faced man of 50, a handsome man. And this is a very sharp contrast with how he's described earlier. Let's take a checkpoint, uh, and I'll give you some time to answer some questions and to collect your thoughts. Okay, you have quite a lot of time, because there's quite a few tasks I'd like you to do. Please read the passage first, and then answer those questions in full sentences. If you need more time, feel free to take it, and of course, Feel free to rewind and re-watch certain sections of the video if you need help. See you soon. Please pause the video. We're now going to focus on the scene right at the end of chapter 5 in which Utterson and Guest discuss, uh, discuss the letter and we'll have a look at that in more detail. I think there are a couple of moments before that takes place that are worth referring to. Firstly, Utterson still suspects that his friend is being blackmailed and we have to remember that blackmail is used, or the idea of blackmail is used by Stevenson as a bit of a red herring. So Utterson fears that his friend, he's, this is the quote, has been sucked down in the eddy of a scandal. And that's what causes him so much trouble. Uh, the reason he thinks that is because he is suspicious of the fact that Jekyll, who hands him a letter that he claims to have been delivered uh, that day, uh, when he asks the servant, they, they don't verify his story. They say that Jekyll uh, has had no post that day. And therefore, Utterson fears that Jekyll is forging for Mr. Hyde. So the letter represents for Utterson uh, Jekyll's forgery for a murderer which obviously causes him great anxiety. Um, and then he has this encounter with, with, with Mr. Guest. And Mr. Guest is a handwriting expert. And we're going to read that last section of chapter 5, which is literally the last few lines of the chapter. OK. I'm going to read from one moment. One moment. I thank you, sir. And the clerk laid the two sheets of paper alongside and sedulously compared their contents. Thank you, sir, he said at last, returning both. It's a very interesting autograph. There was a pause during which Mr. Utterson struggled with himself. Why did you compare them, Guest? He inquired suddenly. Well, sir, returned the clerk, there's a rather singular resemblance. The two hands were at many points identical, only differently sloped. Rather quaint, said Utterson. It is, as you say, rather quaint, returned Guest. I wouldn't speak of this note, you know, said the master. No, sir, said the clerk, I understand. But no sooner was Utterson alone that night than he locked the door of the note, locked the note into a safe where it reposed from that time forward. What, he thought, Henry Jekyll fought for a murderer and his blood ran cold in his veins. What's particularly significant, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here, but you'll notice that each character speaks in, in kind of understatement. They're not saying what they truly think or, or, they're, or they're softening what they truly think. Uh, when Guest says, 
it's a rather singular resemblance between the two handwritings. He, you know, what, he, what he's saying in, you know, in an understated way is that uh, the same person wrote both these notes. And this is significant, of course, because on the one hand, uh, you know, Utterson and Guest, uh, particularly Utterson, m make that, you know, they, they, they interpret that as meaning that Jekyll has forged for Mr. Hyde, that he's, that he's somehow complicit with Hyde in his illegal activities, that for whatever reason, he's trying to protect Hyde, the murderer. That's how, of course, at the end of the ch chapter here, that's how Utterson interprets the significance of the handwriting. For us as readers, uh, for, as for, and for first-time readers, it's another example of a hint or a clue given to us by Stevenson that, of course, Jekyll and Hyde are actually the same person. And again, there have been these gradual dropping, you know, these clues have been sprinkled throughout the narrative. And if we're a particularly astute first-time reader, we might at this point be starting to realise that this novel is actually about a, a man who has managed to create an evil, you know, alter ego in the, and in the form of Hyde. So it's another clue from, Hyde, from, from, from Stevenson that they are the same person. Just to be very clear about why, it's a bit like a snowflake or, or a fingerprint. Uh, your handwriting is, a, is unique to you. It's, they're, they're, there's no, you know, no, no two people have the same handwriting. So it reveals that, the, that whoever wrote both letters, they share an identity. What's actually interesting, I think, more than the letter itself, more than this interesting clue, is the reaction of the two men. Because we see this throughout the novel. Whenever these secrets start to surface, and it does link to the theme of secrecy, whenever these secrets seem to surface, that suggests that you know, Jekyll is involved in, in a scandalous, uh, you know, scandalous affair, the Victorian gentlemen always try to suppress it, and they always try to you know, they always stop themselves from carrying on a conversation. So Utterson saying, I wouldn't speak of this note, and then thrusting it into his safe, which comes to represent, you know, secrecy and, you know, um, repression. They don't, they, they're, they're very much men of their time. They're following that Victorian convention. They're following the Victorian etiquette of the stiff upper lip. Uh, they, they don't seem to approve of gossip or hearsay or rumours and they always stop themselves from discussing these affairs in more detail. It's very similar to what happens in chapter one with Enfield and Utterson on their walk. Once Enfield tells the story, they both agree to never speak of it again. And here, Guest and Utterson come to an agreement, you know, as, as Victorian gentlemen, that they're not going to gossip, they're not going to delve into hearsay. Okay, that is the end of today's video tutorial. Uh, I will see you next time for our lesson on Chapter 6, The Remarkable Incident of Dr. Lanyon. I'll see you next time. Stay safe and stay well.